okay uh, so welcome everyone to another episode of our knowledge base podcast series uh, this time we have with us kashish sambhani kashish is a full time investor and he's probably one of the very few guys who have professional experience in investing in special situation so figuring out how to invest in special situation is what we are going to try to figure out in this podcast so welcome kashish thank you so much andrew thanks for having me right uh so before we begin a uh, standard disclaimer uh search capital is a trade name brand name used by me ankur agrawal i'm a sebi registered individual research analyst nothing that we discuss in this podcast uh should be considered as a recommendation uh we would have more disclaimers and disclosure in the description below kashish do you have any form of sebi registration no no i am not registered with sebi So whatever we discuss today would be purely for educational purpose. No buy or sell recommendation. Uh, so Kashi, let's start from the beginning. Uh, can you talk a bit about your journey, like when you started in the market? Uh, what are some of the key uh, events that shaped up your initial experience, and what eventually led you to, uh, you know, a uh, move to special situation as investing framework for yourself? Right. So I. had some experience with the mutual fund investing right when okay. i started my college that's when i sort of started taking some interest in the family finance so that's how it started started with the mutual fund uh parked some money took it out from the fds and all the post office savings schemes which my dad did and uh, it it did pretty well for us but the eureka moment i would say was one fine day while i was browsing the internet i accidentally landed upon the money reddit page so i must have clicked on some advertisement banner and I landed up there and it was a completely new thing for me stock price charts some numbers and i was just looking at that and while looking at that for one or two minutes uh, the stock price started moving up so it got me really intrigued that what's happening in just one or two minutes the stock which was at 200 210 rupees it started moving up now what changed suddenly so that made me really curious about it and i thought if i had some shares in this company i would have made money right so i thought okay there is some way to sort of learn this and there is some science behind this to sort of how people are making money and how people evaluate stocks so uh, that's when i started doing some more work on it then i consulted the financial advisor through whom we invested in the mutual funds so then i opened a dmat account i bought books of warren buffett and charlie munger and peter lynch so uh, started reading up those books started reading up the annual reports and all and uh, you know it was a very uh, tedious process so nothing was really moving in terms of making money but yeah i was really enjoying because it was on new for me to read up all these people read up on these uh, businesses so it was a completely new and very interesting thing for me so that's what got me started in the markets okay yeah so uh, what eventually led you to move to special situation like did you try something else in the beginning you know tried it for a couple of years that didn't work out and you know was it a particular investment or some event that you know made you realize okay that's this is the way that i want to invest in the market in the long run like do you came across say joel greenbold somehow and that's how what shaped your investing framework or how how was it yeah so while reading about buffett and munger uh, all the theoretical knowledge i had but i was right. finding it really difficult to sort of put into that framework where the businesses were really cheap because uh, this was during 20 uh, 2016 right so the bull run had already started in 2013 so yeah. stocks had already moved up five times 10 times from those lows right so i was really struggling with how should i go about it because i couldn't find any bargains right so uh, that's when i decided to sort of uh, move to bombay join a pms firm so i shifted to bombay in 2017 joined the firm and that's where we started doing the special situation investing because that uh, firm mandate was to invest in the special situation so that's how i got introduced to special situation in joel greenblatt okay yeah okay 
So basically the entire journey of being a special situation investor is more from a professional roles perspective. Yeah, because I had interest in this, so I thought I'll take it up full time. I wanted right. to become a professional investor. And I knew that I can't figure it out on my own because it will take me many, yeah. many years to uh, sort of shorten that journey, shorten that uh, learning curve and sort of learn it very quickly. And that, then I moved to Bombay and uh, that's where the special situation journey began. And that's when I realized that, okay, this is a completely new world where I don't need to be dependent on the, if the stock prices are moved up already, if the market is heated up, there is still a particular section where we could still find those bargains. And uh, yeah, that, that's what made me more uh, intrigued and more interested in this. Because even during 2017, and the market was at highs, yeah. we could find a lot of ideas which were way cheaper than uh, the average market multiples were at that time. So that's how it got me started. So Koshish, how would you define a special situation? Like... Nowadays, 2016, 17, when you started that time, special situation was a very niche thing. I don't think a lot of people were doing it that professionally. Uh, now, in the last few years, it has become sort of an abuse word where a lot of things are being bucketed into it being a special situation, which actually is not true. So what, yeah. according to you, is a special situation? Okay. So when we invest in a company, we are saying that, hey, the val value creation will happen in this business because of the management or because of the business tailwinds. And by investing, I would be participating in that value creation journey. So that's what a typical investment is. But when it comes to special situation, even though the premise remains same, that you want to buy uh, a stock worth 100 rupees at a really cheap price, 50, 60 rupees. So the fundamental principles of investing, margin of safety remains same. But the stark difference here is that you don't need to create much value here. Value has already been created in the company. You just need a catalyst to unlock that value, which has already been created. So the value creation must have happened, but it has not been realized by the market due to XYZ reasons. But now that catalyst has come, that trigger is there for, for that value unlocking to happen. And then you can really have those asymmetric bets, those good risk reward situations in such cases. So the stark difference is value creation versus value unlocking in special situation. Right. Right. Yeah. Actually, that's an interesting perspective to you know to define it like in a layman's term that you don't need actually like you're not looking at the business per se. I mean broadly, you're looking at the what the value is there versus the current say market price or whatever. Makes sense. So Kashish, uh there are multiple types of special situation, right? The catalyst that you're talking about, there are multiple ways in which that catalyst can play out. So, you know, can you talk about different forms of this special situation and, you know, which type of special situation might work the best and say, what are the key ingredients that are needed to create a great special situation? At the same time, you know, which kind of special situation does not work that well uh, in the broader scheme of things? Yeah, so... Uh... Where I have made most of the money, I would say, would be in demergers, okay. where there are multiple uh, business divisions under one corporate entity, and the management decides to hive off certain segment. Uh, so that is one. Uh, second, where there is high probability of success, and where I would say it works almost eight out of ten times, is the promoter chain. Right. So wherever new promoters come in, they come in with their own plans. They come in with new energy. Right. And they have the plans to take the business to next level with the previous promoters couldn't do due to expiry reasons. Maybe they have succession issues. Maybe they don't have that bandwidth. Maybe they don't have that aspiration. So this promoter change is a really lucrative area to play special situations. So D merges. And promoter change, I would say these are the two uh, topmost areas where most of the money has been made. Okay. Okay. So in case of a demerger, uh, you know, what would be some of the key aspects that you might look at? Like, I remember sometime back you once told me that, you know, in case of demerger, most people go out and uh, look for buying the good business of the overall conglomerate. But yeah. the real valuation arbitrage is actually in the 
that business and that is where you are interested in so you know yeah. with, with a couple of example if you can talk about some of the aspects that you look at yeah so uh, let's take an example uh, uh, there is a company called gmr infra which is now called as gmr air force yes. so yeah. uh, they uh, they had multiple businesses under gmr infra they had airport business they had uh, road assets they had power assets and a lot of debt right so they decided to hive up the airport business which is more of a regulated business yeah. versus all these power assets and road assets right and everybody was interested uh, i mean we bought it pre spin right because uh, at that time stock was at 30 rupees or so and uh, as per the numbers even the airport business uh, was valued at maybe 50 rupees a share right and the other business was available for free so uh, we bought that pre spin and uh, the airport business uh, remained in the listed entity and all these uh, other assets of power road and they hyped it up to a uh, different entity right and most of the value was in the airport business because the airport business was doing well they were expanding lot of tailwinds in terms of everybody's preferring the air travel nowadays with uh, more and more airports with more and more connectivity and government boost there so no doubt that the business is going to do well but the interesting part in that business was and at that time also brokers were valuing the other business at 1 rupee or 1 and a half rupee a share out of 30 rupees right and the other business got listed uh, the uh, ratio was around uh, i think one share for 10 so 10 is to 1 was the split so the uh, stock uh, was trading at 18 to 20 rupees means 1.8 to 2 rupees free spread yeah. and the stock was lying there nobody was interested right now the how you look about and how how you look at this is that there was a lot of debt numbers were not there their power assets were not functional they had gas assets they had some issues they had debt at spv level they had recoveries lot of arbitration right so when a demerger happens a company has to go to shareholders as well as your creditors yeah. uh, the bankers they have to approve the scheme so first thing an interesting thing to note here is that bankers will not approve such demerger where they know that the recovery chances would be way less if they approve hiring of this entity into separately listed entity right mm -hmm. so even though it looked ugly on the books with losses and a lot of debt uh, i knew for a fact that it's not as bad otherwise bankers wouldn't have approved it right so the stock was at 18 20 rupees nobody paid attention and they started performing well they had some resolutions in their assets they ventured into energy business because energy has lot of tailwinds they ventured into smart meters right and at that time when we talked to the management they clearly highlighted their plans to sort of focus only on the energy rather than getting into different segments so that played out and no broker coverage nobody talking about that and the stock went from 20 rupees to 140 rupees that's a seven bagger and now recently i think uh, 10 days back one broker has initiated a coverage on uh, gmr power with a price target of 180 to 200 rupees right so this is one example where the where the bad business uh, got hyped off and as we call it it is a ugly duckling right mm -hmm. it it looks ugly and uh, but there's a lot of uh, upside potential and high risk reward there because at 18 20 rupees there was hardly anything to lose right yeah. but with the with venturing into uh, energy segment or some resolution in their assets or some debt rationalization the stock was bound to go up right so that is one example where uh, nobody was talking about it but i made quite good money in that so kashish in your experience is it that i mean Uh, at the back of the head, like if a promoter is demerging certain businesses, that means you know each of the individual business is now gonna do well, which is why the promoter is comfortable demerging it versus say earlier wherein you know since not every business was doing well, so you know it was a consolidated entity to make it look good. So has that been your experience that you know if it's a signal in the sense that you know if the promoter is demerging certain business, then something has changed over there. 
See, absolutely. So in this DMR example, of course, uh, the business was not doing well. But uh, in many cases, uh, in a large conglomerate, many businesses get incubated within okay. that entity itself. Right. So once they realize, okay, now the business can sustain on its own. It has achieved some sort of scale. And that's a, that's a, a clear indication that uh, the business, of course, will do well. And ideally, both of the businesses should do well. Right. But as an investor, we have to pick uh, what's better from an investment perspective. But you but you rightly pointed it that uh, it's a great signal that the both businesses are now self-sufficient, self-reliant, and they can sustain on their own. So, uh, Kashi, in, in this special situation thing, uh, how does screening work for you? I mean, in the most common and say the most, you know, blanket approach is to look at corporate actions on a daily basis, right? Uh, is there something else that helps you in screening and within, uh, you know, looking at corporate actions, are there some hacks that help you, you know, do it much faster and do it much better than say vanilla reading the each individual corporate action? So now it has become extremely easy. When I was doing it back in 2017, there was hardly one or two softwares which would pick it, pick it up for us. Otherwise, one had to manually screen through all the BSC announcement, which was okay. really painful. But now uh, I think you can sort of search it by keywords. So even Screener does that for investors. Okay. I mean, everyone is using Screener. So if you'll go to the announcements and just click on that keyword of uh, scheme of arrangement, you will find all the mergers and demergers right there, right? So screener is the best tool. Then I think there is another tool called the wrap, uh, which is uh, managed by Tarik, who is uh, a dear friend and a good investor. So again, keyword uh, search you can do on that platform. There is R30 newsletter, which sends those yeah, uh, yeah. related announcements at the end of the yeah. day, right? right? So these three, four portals are there, which can filter out it for you on the basis of those keywords. You don't need to really do any hard work for that. It will be landing right in your inbox. So it become okay. very easy now. Okay. So like you look at all these, uh, say the screen that uh, you've talked about, what happens next? Say so you figure out a scheme of arrangement. Then how does the research process work for you? Like the way you have told told me, uh, basically you're more looking at a valuation arbitrage and not necessarily how, or the valuation that business might do. That's uh, that's obviously a part, but that's a secondary part to it. So the right. research process starts with figuring out the valuation arbitrage and then looking at business or how does it work? And maybe something else that you look at. Yeah, so it's not just value uh, valuation arbitrage. It also depends on the quality of business, right? So I would say out of all the announcements of the demergers, I yeah. have uh, done a study of last seven, eight years from when I started doing this. I would say almost 40% demergers are dead. Like they don't okay. result in it to value creation. Be primarily because the businesses are not that good, right? Or the valuations were not in favor. So okay. uh, that is one thing which I found out. And second, let's say any announcement comes. So the first thing... Uh, which I look at it is that if the demerger is really, uh, you know, when the many a times when demerger happens, they are hiring off one of their business entity in, into their uh, subsidiary, right? Or they are merging uh, among the various group entities. Yeah, so okay. there is no no real value unlocking no. happening there. Yeah. It's just it's just some uh, restructuring yeah. on the books. So first filter which I look at it is that okay if it's really hiving off of a business and are they going to list it separately so that we can have a pie of that business once it gets listed, yeah. right? So that's the first thing. Then second thing I look at it is, okay, what business exactly is there, right? And why is management doing this? What is the rationale behind doing this, right? Is it a bad business being hived off or is it a small business being hived off which has a really high growth potential? And now management wants to list it and infuse some capital there and unlock and value there and grow that business there. So that is another thing. So second thing is the motivation of the management of the promoter to do that corporate action because uh, it's such a lengthy process where you have to take multiple approvals from uh, exchanges, SEBI, shareholders, court and everything. So if they're doing it, what's the purpose, right? Business, how the business is and then the valuation part. Is it really cheap? If it's really cheap, then I would start the work right away. Saying that, okay, okay, this looks cheap. Let me dig it further. 
and if i see okay no it's fairly valued or it's expensive then i can take some time off and then have a look at it later so valuations come into picture only if i want to do the work right away or not yeah 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 no that that's interesting what you said like figuring out the intention yeah yeah that's an interesting part uh, one of the key question that i wanted to ask uh, you kachi is is the relevance of timing in this whole special situation like as you told it's a very lengthy process like uh, so there are different phases you can buy when the announcement is made you can buy just before the split you can buy probably once the new entity has listed so there are a lot of variables here and there so uh, with a couple of examples you can explain which type of opportunity should be bought when and like i remember like when you guys went ahead and bought the entire quantity of tips films at lower circuit made a quick double in just a week so i mean this kind of uh, plays requires a different level of conviction and timing to pull it off right so the whole relevance of timing in buying and selling this kind of opportunity right right so uh, it's very subjective uh, and sort of when do you want to assuming you want to take a position when should you take a position should it yeah. be right when it's announced or you should wait for some more action on this in terms of getting the approvals done so uh, then i would say it boils down to the valuation part say if you have made okay. up your mind that it looks interesting uh, and the valuation is in your favor and then uh, for so let me give you an example of one special situation which is still running so i i hold the position in this company uh, career point uh, is the company name and uh, they announced a the demerger almost 15 months or 18 months back right and uh, so career point had two divisions one of course the education business which many people must be aware of they are into coaching business for iits yeah. and medical students and uh, the second business was of nbfc so what was happening here is uh, the education business is high margins business right 50 60% ebitda margins you don't need much capital to invest in this right so high return on capital high margin business growing reasonably well but the cash flows of the those, uh, that education business was being diversified into the nbfc business and they were doing lending through that nbfc right so in this case uh, it's a classic demerger where the market will not give you the value of that education business because uh, yeah. the cash flows are not being invested back into the business or they are not being paid to the shareholder right so as i previously mentioned that value unlocking has to happen the value is already there so in right. that case the education business was doing well the value was already created by the promoters but just the utilization of fund was not how market will look at it in a very positive manner which was suppressing the value so the stock price was really depressed so when they announced it i think it was around 160 165 rupees a share they announced the demerger that nbfc uh, will remain this thing and the education business will be high block so uh, when i did the numbers uh, at that time one of the business was available for free it was a mirror demerger so either the, whatever value i would assign either if i, I would assign one x book to the nbfc or some uh, 15 20 p to the education business which is very conservative right right on those conservative multiples i was getting one of the business for free right now in this case i wouldn't wait and say oh, let let them take them some approvals and then i will look at it here i am getting something for free so i bought it right away the very next day saying that okay it will be a tedious process but the margin of safety is so high that it makes right. sense to buy right away So I bought it at hundred and seventy rupees a share, and as and when the demerger progressed, the numbers uh, performance was also good in education business. So your business is growing, and then again, this it's not just the valuation arbitrage. Step one, valuation arbitrage is so huge that you are getting one business for free. Right. Step two is the uh, business is also doing well, so the business is growing, so the value is also Thank being you. created, right? So and third, your demerger. process is progressing well where you are taking approvals and it takes many many months so if you now if you see the stock price it has re-rated from 170 rupees a share to 500 rupees a share right almost three wow. times and okay. during this period profits haven't grown three times or so the top line hasn't yeah. grown three times it's just that market is now realizing that 
the cash flows won't be diversified into something unrelated activity. So let me just value it properly. So that value unlocking has happened more than the value creation. So this was a pretty easy pick, right? And it made a lot of sense to buy it right away. Whereas sometimes, uh, and again, one Mirza International, which we bought, they hyped up red tape. So at 80, 90 rupees a share, even assigning a very depressed multiple as compared to the two companies, it was a no-brainer. So like, so if the margin of safety is very high, uh, I buy it right away, just after the announcement. If the margin of safety isn't that high, the upside is not that great, then I wait it out, right? Then I may buy pre-spin, I may buy post-spin, that's separate. But I just waited. I, I don't uh, jump into it right away. The only part where uh, I buy post pin is uh, there was one demerger of Arti Surfactants, which happened from Arti Industries. So Arti Industries obviously is a very big company as yeah, compared to the Surfactants division, which was very small. Right. And it was fairly valued as well, right? Arti Group is widely tracked. Right. So there, there was hardly any. A surprise left for the market to sort of re it. So in that case, the demerger got announced and we waited for it. That, okay, we want to participate in that small piece, which was Arti Surfactants. Now again, coming back to the point which you said that it's a great indication. And now the yeah. business can do well on its own. They don't need support from the parent. So that was the first trigger that the demerger of Surfactant division is happening now. This business can sustain on its own and obviously it will grow. Because the business was growing at not for yeah. 20%. And I don't want to uh, take risk or have that exposure to entire chemical and other pharma division of the RT industries. So yeah. RT surfactants, I bought after the demos. And since it was a very small piece and uh, RT industries had lots of mutual fund mutual holding, percent. institutional holding, so they had no option but to dump it. Because it became such a small part of their portfolio, it would not have been as per their mandate of investing. So they had to dump. I remember the stock price was at 500. It uh, reduced to half. It was almost at 250 rupees a share. And that day we bought and the volume uh, traded on that particular day, I think was uh, in double digits of the entire equity. So that time promoter also bought on the same day. Okay. Yeah, so uh, we were pretty clear that some heavy buying is happening. We didn't know the promoter was buying. And right. huge equity changed hands at that time. And stock was available at a throwaway valuation. So in that case, we bought after the spin. Yeah. So, Kashish, is it still relevant? Like, like this is a known fact that, you know, uh, in such kind of demergers, mutual funds and funds uh, come and sell at whatever price. And it's obviously a bad selling, like right? they are selling it for whatever price that is there and creating a value discount for uh, smart investors to come and buy it. So like yeah. over the over time, has it changed that these institutions have realized that, you know, we should not do it and they take some time to do it or is it still uh, uh, very prevalent that they just do it? So what I have observed over, the, over many years is the situation hasn't changed. Like they okay. still come and sell it because okay. uh, it's, if it's not as per their mandate, they cannot do yeah. anything about it, right? They yeah. cannot go against it. And second, as we said, that the position becomes very small for them if a small division right. is getting out. So A, if it's not as per your mandate and the position is too small to make any impact, why would you take a chance for the regulations, right? Why would you violate anything? We would rather just yeah. dump it up and not care about that incremental profit, which will not yeah. uh, do things for you. So the selling is still prevalent. And especially in the cases where the business which is hiring off is very small and or a different segment altogether, there the selling happens. Like for example, okay, so let's not talk about RT because the division was small. Let's talk about Piramal Enterprise, right? In Piramal Pharma, the stock corrected from 170 rupees to almost 120 rupees. And that MSK yeah. inclusion, exclusion thing. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. Pharma, your mandate is not to invest in pharma company. So right. even such a widely tracked company, uh, funds yeah. had to sell. What happens in that case is that once it's widely tracked and know that the fund selling is happening, uh, the price will not correct that much because the other fund might be interested in yeah. buying it. Yeah. 
right? Pharma funds would be interested that, okay, we will not get such kind of bargain. Let's just buy it. So the value arbitrage sort of decreases in that case, but the selling is still prevalent. It happens. Yeah. I mean, the reason I was asking this for that, like a couple of years back, like the whole MSCI play, say MSCI index rebalance is going to happen. People, you used to jump in, but now it doesn't play out that well because as soon as the announcement comes, people start buying it. And then they come and sell it to MSCI index at the day of, you know, rebalance. So at the day of rebalance, a lot of stocks don't go higher despite MSCI yeah. buying because a lot of people know and they just stop selling it and they come at the time of uh, MSCI. So from the same perspective, I wanted to ask that, you know, does it happen that, you know, since other funds also know that this guy is going to come and sell, are they waiting to buy? And does that, you know, prevents a much lower drawdown? But we have, as, as you've rightly explained, like, different kind of companies uh maybe some funds will come and buy because of their understanding makes sense makes sense so uh kashish how does valuation uh, uh sorry portfolio allocation works for you and say the these of individual pets like what is one of the key ingredients that defines you know how uh say you would allocate higher or you'll allocate lower is, is there something has to do with the timing as well like say uh you are buying just as the announcement has come so maybe say it will take 15 20 months so you take that into account as well or maybe in case of say a company has got team merge and it's now moving into lower circuits you have to go and actually buy the lower circuit risk obviously is a different mindset and a different gut is needed to go and buy into lower circuit because you are the one who's gonna uh push on the stock then so in different situation how does allocations work for you like so uh first thing uh when i invest i look at something between three to five years, right? My investment horizon is three to five years. Situations play well before that, that's fine. I'll just take my money off the table. But uh, so the investment horizon is three to five years. So that doesn't compel me from looking at things in the short term, right? So uh, I don't care if it if the demand is going to take a longer time. As long as I find that value, which I highlighted in career fund, that one business is available for free. I don't care if it takes 18 months or 36 months for them to get this done, right? The margin of safety is so compelling that I would make it a big position, right? When I say big position, I would park somewhere between 7 to 10% of my capital in such situation, right? Okay. And uh, in terms of portfolio allocation, that's a, because I had this entire journey. So okay. I started... Uh, during 2017 2019 phase the capital was small so rather than looking at it from a per uh, percentage thing i okay. used to park absolute amount so okay. i invested in five to six companies my entire portfolio was five to six companies okay. right uh, and then covid happened small cap carnage happened right and i went through a lot of volatility during that phase just like other investors and the portfolio had drawdown of 40 45 percent right okay. uh, but the interesting part about having those five six situation positions was uh, one of the stock went down by 50 percent okay let's just say i had to book the loss it was not right. optional another stock went down by 40 percent right and there were drawdowns third stock went double fourth stock tripled and fifth okay. stock went up 20 times. So yeah. the 20 times stock I wrote on the Twitter yeah. and my blog as well, which is in the plywood sector. Right. And the overall KGAR was handsome, right? Because right. one stock did the trick. Yeah. And the allocations, if you could say, were anywhere with around 15, 17% in one stock. And uh, the volatility was too much for me to handle, right? Because if you have such a big position, it's not easy to just book yeah. a loss and get out. And mm -hmm. it's uh, difficult as well on the upside when the position becomes too big. What do you do then? 20% becoming almost 200% of the portfolio, right? Yeah. So uh, then I started diversifying. Post-COVID, I thought, okay, I cannot take this much volatility. Let me just diversify it out now. And in that process, I started putting money in 25 to 30 names. I just moved to okay. 3 to 4% bets. It became very conservative because of that volatility. But when I, when I did the annual review of all my positions and how I did or how could I have improved, I realized that if I would have allocated my money in those handful of names where I was, where I had the highest conviction, I would have made more money. 
I wouldn't have to deal with so many stocks in my portfolio, right? In terms of tracking and uh, doing more work on it. So that's when I realized that I don't want to be too concentrated in this five names, nor I want to be too diversified in 25 names. So I picked my sweet spot that is around 12 to 15 names. So now my portfolio will have only 12 to 15 companies. That's it. And in that also, majority of that would be in top 10 names only. So I found my sweet spot around there. And I also, I struggled a lot with this uh, allocation. I read up a um, lot of stuff on this in terms of how all these investors who have made it big, how did they allocate their capital? And be it Buffett, be it Munger, Joel Greenblatt, right, George Soros, Bracken Miller, right, all these legendary investors. I mean, many people quote them and yeah. talk a lot about them every second day. What they don't discuss is these guys had five to seven names in their portfolio, okay. right? So they all were highly concentrated. And of course, the kind of work they did, I am not able to do that sort of work, right? And the volatility they went through, it's a lot of psychological pain as well to sort of yeah. live through that volatility. So I decided that, okay, let me stick to 12 to 15 names and uh, my returns would still be way higher as compared to those 25 names and the risk would also be mitigated. And one important point here is that when I'm putting my capital in those 12 names, I'm not putting it particular sector. So right. for example, if I play career point, which is 10% of my portfolio, that is into education mainly, right? Yeah. Let's skip the NBFC part, but I'm playing largely on the education. Now, when I'm picking another name, I will not put my money into the education sector okay. unless or until there is any special situation which is highly compelling. I will not be doing that. Then I would look at diversifying. So these 12 names, but among different industries or different situations playing out. So that okay. takes care of the diversification. So even though the names are only 12, but they are well diversified. And it also gives a great upside because if any position goes wrong, on a 10% position, I'm losing hardly 2% or 3% of my overall portfolio. Okay. But if the position goes right, let's say career point, it became 3x. So the 10% will go to 30% and will take care of the duds, which right. didn't perform. So that's how I make my portfolio of 10 names. And allocation varies on the margin of safety. My principle is very clear. Margin of safety has to be there. Right. Business quality is obviously important, but for me, valuations come first. Right. Yeah. So even though business quality would be great, but the margin of safety is not there, I will not have that confidence to place my bet there and allocate 10% of my capital there. So I'll, I'll give you an example in this. Uh, so I played uh, Eureka Forbes B merger. Uh, it was earlier within the Forbes and company, which was listed. Um, so this example will highlight the entire process, right? In terms of portfolio allocation and how I look at things. So uh, SP group, suppose the financial group had debt issues, right? right? And as per the debt covenant, they had to sell Eureka folks to someone and that too within stipulated deadline, right? Okay. So in such situation, that's a forced selling where the promoter is forced to sell. Yeah. And then they sold Eureka folks to a private equity player, right? They bought the, uh, they came in, uh, this was all before the team merger, right? right? They came in, they announced that we'll be having off this business because SP Group will retain Forbes and company and private equity will have its Eureka yeah. Forbes business. So uh, this stock was available at 4,000 rupees a share, right? And at that time when I did the valuation work, uh, that uh, Eureka Forbes itself would have been worth 6,000 rupees a share, right? Okay. So the valuation, again, the margin of safety was so huge. Right. And the business quality is so great that Eureka Forbes was a renowned name. So I got into that stuff. And of course, if one would look at the financials back then, the numbers were in terrible shape. Yeah. Then I looked at Kent Aro. Uh, Kent Aro was doing double digit EBITDA margins, growing 12 to 13%, 15%, whereas Eureka Forbes were doing 2-3% of EBITDA margin. Yeah. So I knew the numbers are not sustainable, of course, the numbers will improve and that's what private equity has looked at. So yeah. the intention of management is clear that they right. have to, they are course sellers here. Yeah. 
intention of new player is also right there i can see the, the the margins are depressed the numbers are depressed right the profitability go through the roof and the valuation at which they got in was really cheap so i made it a proper position and you are between 5 to 10% i pick so that's one because your margin of safety is there your business quality right. is also there so you can confidently allocate that 5 to 10% of your capital so that is one and then second when it comes to so we of course wrote it and the, both the stocks did pretty well right and again coming back to the point that eureka forbes will obviously do well this is a sexy business yeah. but surprisingly forbes and company also gave phenomenal returns despite having all the debt issues because the management high tops they also knew that they can sustain and improve the performance yeah. so that stock also gave crazy returns like i got out because i i couldn't anticipate those things but that yeah. ugly duckling also made great money Right. So that's when that's how we played, and uh, great return on capital business, great franchise, right? So valuation is there, margin of safety is there, what I'm highlighting. Then you can allocate your capital to such names. Then again, diversification because I didn't have something in the consumer piece, so you are diversifying as well. So Kashish, here uh, obviously the margin of safety part is understood. Uh, but to an extent, uh, in most of the situations that you're taking, uh, there's a level of higher uncertainty as well, right? Uh, like maybe it takes much longer for, you know, the whole corporate action to play out. Sometimes it might like not get approved also for some reason, right? I'm not sure whether, whether that has happened in your case, like right, based on your experience. So uh, do you discount that as well? Uh, that, you know, this certain level of uncertainty, like say, for example, after the merger, if you're buying a stock, you believe that this is the right valuation, for example, like in case of Piramal Pharma, right? A lot of people went and bought at certain valuation because it was cheap, but it, it kept going lower from that point as well, right? I think the stock went down to some 60 bucks from 170, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, so there's a certain level of uncertainty that is there uh, when you come and tell to market that, you know, you are wrong, I am right, that uh, from the valuation arbitrage perspective, so, do you discount that as well to some extent uh, when you try to allocate? Yeah, so that is also one thing. So, I'll give you an example where the demergers got delayed beyond our expectations. So I'll give you two examples. And this was right, uh, right after those uh, IBC cases which were being handled yeah. by NCT. So, this demerger approval took a lot of time because they didn't have, the court didn't have that sort of bandwidth to clear all, everything and yeah. uh, at that time we bought CESC so CESC CESC that yeah, Kolkata yeah, power yeah, company yeah, yeah. so they had uh, uh, power generation assets Genco they yeah. had power distribution, distribution. assets they had uh, this 2M which is uh, yeah, snack, snack yeah, which is now under I think CESC ventures and they were also hiring off uh, Spencer's. They had Spencer's retailers. Yeah. So, uh, power company, snack, and retail chain. Right. All of them unrelated. Yeah. Now, this demerger had to go through and uh, surprisingly, regulators said that you cannot hive off the Genco and the transmission business. Okay. Right. They had the regulatory challenge there. So, then they went ahead and they did the uh, CSE Ventures and uh, Spencer's demerger. Okay. So what happened in that case was, okay, they had certain scheme which was laid out and they went for the approvals. It didn't go through. Then they amended that scheme, again went back to the regulators and all the parties. So right. it took a lot of time. So that was one delay. Then we also played uh, HSIL demerger, uh, which is now Hindware Homes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so they were demerging this division. They had a lot of delays, right, with court was uh, not giving them the approval for one or the other reason, right? And uh, it took more than, uh, I think it took almost three years for them to get the approval. So we were early there and uh, there was a lot of opportunity cost in that case. So usually it doesn't happen that much now, but I have seen that case where the demerges got postponed and I don't recall, but there were a couple of demerges which got cancelled also. So for, okay, so this is another example, GHCL. GHCL is into soda ash. 
and they had another division of textiles in that text uh, so they were uh, hiving of the textiles business and uh, most of the approvals were there and then they decided within textiles they wanted to sell one division to another company okay. right so you have soda ash you have textile you are separating the textile but within the textile they got an offer of certain yeah. division and they sold it to a company right okay. so that put a pause to the process nobody could expect that they would be yeah. uh, doing the sale transaction in the middle of uh, all this regulatory action and uh, that got the demerger delayed yeah. so there many times it happens that the demerger gets delayed and i bake it to that but uh, that is more of a subjective thing so uh, one key point here would be if a big company is doing it it would be relatively faster if a small company is doing it it would take a lot of time okay. so when let's say it should happen in 15 months when there is a big company it will, they will close it in 15 to 18 months but when there is a small company it could take 24 months 30 months as well so that is one thing which i keep into account that okay that de uh, delays could happen here so that's when again the valuation picture comes into play that if the valuations are competing take that risk if the upside is only 20 25% with lot of with the delays also kicking in then i would just skip it i would just move on to next so that bet has to be uh, good in terms of risk reward that upside has to be asymmetrical if it's a say with a 20 25% upside then yeah. i don't want all of this headache i would just uh, buy something thematic i would yeah. buy a good company which is growing at 15 20% i can make that return there as well okay. uh so at this uh, allocation part as well uh which is are there enough opportunities at any given point so you are investing 12 to 15 opportunities so at any given point do you have this 12 to 15 special situation playing out or one should assume that cash is a natural position in a special situation portfolio or another point being that do you invest in something else say if you are not getting special situation do you invest in some other normal kind of opportunities as well so i think 12 to 15 opportunities are usually there if okay. we talk from one year perspective because mm -hmm. what happens is a uh, demerger is announced so you have the opportunity to buy pre spin off and okay. then once the demerger happens then you have the opportunity to participate in either of the two companies okay right so one situation plays out multiple times so okay. that is one so at any given point of time the 12 opportunities i can find in a year that is given but again if the valuations go up too fast i might sell right yeah. i can have the cash and in that case uh, i then move to other opportunities i don't simply stick to special situation if it's not there if it's not something compelling then i would yeah. move to something thematic for example uh, let's say qsr is doing well as a theme right yeah. or uh, when we discussed right, indigo was a great yeah. buy Right, mm -hmm. so then I move to those opportunities, but my yeah. first preference is always special situation. I have no problem in holding cash as well because I know at some point the opportunity will kick in, yeah. and I will have all the chance to swing at that time. Yeah, that's the part, right? I mean, uh, the way the like like you were giving example, the announcement came today, and you have to buy tomorrow. In certain cases, if the opportunity is very compelling, so cash is actually something that has to be there in the portfolio to make those kind of plays, right? So. Yeah, so I don't buy any liquid means. I don't do any FNO or all of that. Yeah, yeah. I'm okay holding cash because I know the day opportunity will come. It will cover up for all the loss yeah, time. Yeah. For example, uh, we both play tips industries yeah. demerger, right? So uh, I remember tips industries demerger announcement came at five in the evening, and uh, yeah. I did some work there on the same day. And at nine a.m., I had to buy. It. So if I didn't yeah. have the cash. i couldn't have bought that stock and stock it continues up so gets right from that yeah, day yeah. so i always hold on to cash because and another example i can give you recently a demerger got announced uh, of jubilant industries industry yeah 20 20% yeah. for a couple of days yeah at at 600 uh, the yeah. announcement came next day stock was at 600 i bought yeah. in at 600 and as i said 20 20% and it's a three bagger in six months yeah. right i so think it was trended in couple of days only Yeah, in a week it got doubled. So uh, yeah. I was then seeing where did I make fastest money? Was it test films 
और वो अदर जॉब तो या कैश कैश हैज नो अदर पोजीशंस नो स्मॉल पोजीशंस नथिंग टू काउंटर दैट कैश इज द किंग या अनदर थिंग कैश इज ओवर हियर लाइक से इफ यू बाय अ कंपनी for a special situation to play for the most part to play the valuation arbitrage uh, once that part is over uh, do you end up holding those investment for example like tips you have held on to for so long like in three odd years almost right yeah. so if you like the growth and the business do you continue to hold them or for the most part of the special situation that because in special situation you want a very non linear kind of risk reward right so once that non linear part is over do you move for the most part exit it or in some situations you are comfortable holding it for the longer run so mostly i exit it uh, okay when the arb is over things are fairly valued mostly exit but then it comes to business quality like tips is as i wrote yeah. on the twitter it was a it's the best business i've held till date right so there i would hold it if the business is doing well uh, but in case so let's say uh, the eureka folks the merger which i discussed yeah uh in that case i exited adjusting for the ratio i exited at 520 530 rupees a share two years back okay just after the listing i exited and after two years stock is still at the same price right right, right. business has done well everything is good but valuations were at that level where it made no sense to hold on to it right. uh another thing that i wanted to ask kashish is this. uh increasingly i have seen that pre ipo is now a part of you know different kind of special situation i see a lot of investors now buying into pre ipos when company is going to list get listed in say next 6 to 12 months because at those times you're getting some extremely well you know discounted valuation versus some of the fears that might be trading at the listed space so do you think it increasingly becoming a lucrative opportunities for investors like you to do pre ipo investments yeah so i won't call pre ipo investment a special situation because as i said there is no value unlocking happening here you still yeah, have to create the value right yeah. so it's not special situation investing it's just that something which you like and you bought it for a really cheap price that's just high margin of safety and normal investing which we do um, right. i think it's a great play but again i am very careful because it all boils down of course you are getting the companies that are very cheap valuation but after investing in few names i realized why it is cheap it is cheap because i am taking that risk where the promoter is not proven yet of course they are doing well but once yeah. they are listed the kind of transparency is there after listing track record after listing is completely different ball game right? right so i am betting on the promoter that he will continue to do well right second uh the ipo could take a very long time to come right so uh, it could get delayed beyond anyone's expectation regulator let's say regulator is not even approving allowing your ipo to happen then what will you do in that case then you are stuck with yeah. the investment recently sme changed the rules yeah. of listing right yeah. and in that case again your listing gets stuck so uh, there is a lot of risk involved in pre ipo investment it is just like private investment right so instead of buying a startup or doing angel investing a sort of going one step backward and saying that okay i know the game this will get listed this is the valuation it will yeah. get so let me just buy it here but again it has its own set of risk so i would say someone with a small capital should not look at pre ipos they should just continue exploring the listed space and not get their money stuck because there are a lot of ideas in the listed space itself right with high degree of certainty when will make money someone who has big capital they may look at diversifying like i have made four five investments in last one year right but uh, yeah so one has to be careful with this if they find a great business then why not like they should go ahead with it. so the uh, standard investing principles apply there okay uh, another thing i wanted to ask you purchase is that uh, special situations you know there are a lot more tools now to discover them i mean a lot of people are now actively looking at special situation as a certain kind of bet that they want to buy into so over the last 3 4 years has it become uh, relatively more difficult to make money in special situation versus earlier wherein obviously there was not a lot of discovery a lot of 
not a lot of people looking at it. And now since a lot of people are looking at it, maybe the discounting happens much faster and that reduces the scope of errors. Like say, if you're not in there in say the time that is needed, the you might miss out on a lot of games. Has, ha, in your observation over the last say seven, eight years, has it become uh, a relatively difficult versus say in the past? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It has become difficult because I said seven, eight years back, there were hardly any tool to track yeah. all of this. I had to do a lot of manual work, a lot of grind to identify it and then to keep a track over those 18, 24 months of events that uh, how is the team are progressing and not many people talking about it. Now with screener and all these tools, it's just you just need to click and it's right there. So identification of those opportunities have become easier. Tracking has become way easier. So, of course, competition has increased. But I would also say that it is also because of the bull market. Because if there is bull market, you find everything to be reasonably valued. You don't have enough margin of safety. Then what do you look at? You say, okay, this is a segment where I could find those bets. Let, let me just also explore this segment. So, then the competition increases even further. But let's say when the market is normal, right? Mm -hmm. Let's not even go to bear market. Bear market, so everything will be available for cheap. Let's say in a normal market, you would say that I am getting this business for a cheap price. I can make my 20 to 30% CAGR in this. Why should I look at special situation, do the work, yeah. take the regulatory risk of the merger not going through, and then track all these events, then sell the debt business, yeah. bet more on the good part, right? It's a lot of work and a lot of headaches. So you would yeah. not be interested in that in normal market condition. Mm -hmm. So uh, partly it is because of those track, uh, tracking become easier, but mostly I would say it's the bull market effect. And even in this, the judgment plays a critical part. Yeah. right? Because the beauty about special situation is that just like investing, rules are not applicable here. Yeah. You can't say, yeah. I'm going to buy just after announcement, before announcement. I'm going to yeah. buy only the small business. Uh, you will not be able to make money if you follow the rules. So a lot of judgment kicks in. That's where the opportunities are there. So for example, career point, many people were not interested because yeah. people were writing on Twitter that NBFC has 45 crores of NB, uh, NPA. It is mm -hmm. given to related party and all of that. Right? But then it requires one step extra. I mm -hmm. analyze all the goals. I talk to the management. I figured out what exactly the transaction is. How much should I trust them? How much should I discount uh, this NPA? How much should I discount the management guidance? Right? That's that's where the edge is. Your investing skill, your judgment will give you the edge. And the competition, I think, will keep on increasing only. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it has increased. It has become difficult for us. Yeah. So, the final question, Kashish, uh... If you can highlight one, two biggest winners of yours and one, two biggest losers and the whole journey, like how you discovered them, what made you buy them and what were some of the eventual learnings that came out of some of these specs? Yeah, so biggest biggest winner, I would say, was Green Panel. Uh, okay. That I bought around 2019. Uh, so Green Panel got demos from Greenfly Industries and... Uh, at that time, MDF prices were low because they were facing a lot of heat from the imports. A lot of capacity expansion was happening. Uh, Green Panel itself uh, set up a very large plant in India at almost, I think, 540,000 cubic meters. And uh, they were, I think, second largest in Asia at that time. And okay. there, with that capacity, there was a lot of uh, oversupply. Demand was healthy. Demand was growing at 20%. So they had, uh, this created a uh, temporary oversupply situation. And Green Panel also had a lot of debt because the massive capex they undertook, they had to take the debt, right? And I remember stock listing at 40, going back to 30, because at that time, all these small caps and mid caps, they yeah. were not doing well. There was a yeah. carnage. So mm -hmm. here you have one entity which got listed where uh, the business is suffering because of uh, demand and supply imbalance. Pricing is down because of imports. You have debt-laden balance sheet, right? Nobody would like to buy it. And again, uh, people knew it was Greenfly was widely tracked stock, right? Yeah. 
so it's not yeah. that people were not aware but at that time everything was available at uh, such a good valuation that who would say ki no i want to back this player which is jet led in and i want to take the risk of uh, losing my capital right yeah. i presented that idea in a forum not nobody was interested nobody was interested in buying that the stock did well and then covid happened right yeah. stock went from 30 to 60 and again went back to 25 entire market moved but green panel didn't move right but then even we couldn't anticipate the kind of uh, demand which came due to covid everyone was sort of renovating their home because all of them were short of space and demand just took off and uh, the competition supply which was supposed to come on stream that got delayed because of covid yeah, yeah. right so it played out really well uh, they were ramping up they were paying off their debt pricing improved imports couldn't happen for a brief period right and the stock it was so cheap i was getting it at uh, 30 rupees i was getting it for somewhere 350 crores market cap right and the asset value of those mdf plant was 1100 crores right the rest of it was debt obviously yeah. but uh, the simple calculation here was market cap was 360 crores debt was 500 550 crores right somewhere around 1000 crores was enterprise value even if they would have created some value from 1000 crores to 1500 crores right the debt would yeah. still remain 500 550 yeah yeah and your equity would yeah. be almost three times so that yeah. was the play so uh, i was playing that valuation arbitrage i knew that at some point the demand will pick up the supply will get absorbed and i did my numbers at that time it was available at three times forward ebitda right today three times ebitda yeah people have yeah. not heard of <laughs> yeah so yeah. stock and kept on doing well it it became a 20 bagger of course i sold it across yeah. uh, along the way but uh, that was the biggest winner and then second was of course chips industries that also almost became a 10 bagger so yeah these two were the big winners And, and on uh, the losing so side, losing side, I would say I don't want to act cocky, but I don't have, I didn't have any uh, big losses. If I bet on something, uh, many a times what has happened is that I have lost money because the situation got dragged for so long, and the value on lock didn't happen as per my anticipation. Right? So, for example, HSIL. i bought in and uh, there was a drawdown of almost 45 50% 50%% at that time and even though when the situation improved uh, i was stuck in that position for a really long time so my cagr was hardly anything so uh, again that advantage of betting only on these 12 13 businesses is you do a lot of work and you take care lot of margin of safety into account that my premise is that i don't want to lose money that is my first thing so ideally i want to buy where there is very low probability of losing money where if i run the bear case and bull case even the bear case should throw some upside right so for example business available for free or a small business which is getting hammered because of forceful selling in all these cases uh, the valuation plays a big role where you have that safety but the contrary is that the situation don't play out and uh, so i don't have any real loss of capital in that sense it's more of a notional loss or opportunity cost exactly these as far as special situation which i could recall if i would have made other investment uh, there yeah. i would have lost money but in special yeah. situation per se i haven't lost money exactly okay. yeah uh, so that were a lot of good insights kashish uh, thanks for it uh in the end with each of this podcast what we do is uh we like to have a take away in form of what is looking interesting to you maybe a stock or a sector and why like you don't necessarily have to name them but a directional insights would also help if you can share so uh i would say in terms of special situation i think uh, recently raymond lifestyle got listed Yeah. and uh, that is also down from almost 28 2900 to 2400 uh, so that could be an interesting play because i was looking at the valuation was trading at almost 13 times ebitda 
I look at it uh, with respect to the other players, how they are doing, they are richly valued. So I think some sort of opportunity could, could emerge here in this situation. And uh, again, no no buy or sell yeah, recommendation, yeah. but I, I see that there is a very, uh, very less chance of losing money from this level. Upside could be debatable in terms of how they grow because they are guiding for doubling their EBITDA by 2028. Yeah, and uh, so if they can perform on those lines or if market would be kind enough to sort of give them the valuation which other listed players are commanding, then it could throw a great upside, right? So yeah. that could be one interesting play right now. Got it, got it, got it. Okay. Thank you so much, Kashish, for doing this. I think uh, a lot was learned from this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ankush, for having me.